Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, my speech is going to be in English, and since we have a lot of things to, to see today, if I speak too fast, just make the uh, typical Italian slow down sign, go like, slow down, and I will. Um, the title, as uh, Sylvain just said, is Critical Infrastructures in the Age of Cyber Insecurity. And I was very lucky that the previous speaker introduced this, some of the themes that we are going to touch today in a wonderful way. So uh, I'm really happy about this. It's going to help me a lot. So this is the agenda. Who am I in 60 seconds, I promise. Then cyber insecurity is the new norm. Why are we here? Impacts of cyber insecurity on critical infrastructures. Latest incidents, remediations with a question mark and conclusions. Uh, the whole thing is going to take 40 minutes so that we will have a few minutes for question and answers in the end. Uh, so, as I promised in 60 minutes, who I am? I am the founder and general manager of Security Brokers, which is a company that deals with cyber defense and security services. So we work with MOD, uh, basically, and large enterprise in, in cyber security uh, in dealing with cybersecurity issues. The other company deals with uh, mainly training and intelligence on social media. Uh, I'm a member of the Cyber World Working Group of the uh, Italian National Security Observatory, which is a very interesting table made up of civilian and military experts discussing cybersecurity issues. Um, and then well, there are other things, but the most important is here, because we will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, I'm a board member of CLUSIT, which is the Italian Association of Information Security Experts, and I am one of the authors of the report, which is a 150 pages book that is being published every year since 2011, and we will see some statistics that we uh, made from our database of international attacks uh, later. Uh, well, <coughs> you already know this, but it's always good to uh, see some numbers and graphs and to, uh, uh, to really focus on what's going on. Uh, it is true, this is a uh, statistics from, from Ponemon Institute, they say that for advanced cybersecurity, the expense globally was 20 billion US dollars last year. Uh, on an overall budget of 60 billion US dollars for ICT security spending only for private organizations. But not with notwithstanding this, cyber security is now the norm. Uh, we see these are CLUSIT's data. We have a database of large, I mean, serious with impacts on the stock exchange value of a company, with impacts on the reputation, with impacts on uh, th hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, personal records and so on. So uh, we have a database nowadays which is made up of more or less 2,500 serious cyber attacks which were uh, uh, performed in the last 36 months in the world. And this is the, the tendency. So it is clear, even from our small sample, that things are not going in the right direction. Um, and by, from our numbers, the rate of attacks, of serious known attacks, in 2012 grew by 154% compared to 2011. And in the first six months of 2013, this uh, trend has been confirmed. So we have an issue because this is an exponential growth. It means that in four years, the problem is going to be two orders of magnitude bigger. So it changes in quality and not on only in quantity. Uh, the first reason why we are here is this. ICT products are not as secure as you may think if you are not into cybersecurity. For those who are into cybersecurity, they are insecure by design, almost all of them, which is an issue because we use these things uh, which were made in labs 
I was in Berkeley in 1991, and I saw guys actually coding and, uh, and writing RFPs for FTP or things like that. And that same stuff was <laughs> spread on a, on a planet scale in the next 20 years without really thinking about security. So now we have a problem, which is this one. Many people think that they're using this. In fact, what they have is this. So there is a huge perception issue at the base of everything we're going to say today. My Fiat, <laughs> it was my first car, I was very proud of it. It had no built-in security whatsoever, nothing at all. It was a, a, a moving coughing, <laughs> I used to call it. Okay? <laughs> so uh, as a consequence, and this number was more or less also mentioned by the previous speaker, in 2012, this issue caused a direct and indirect estimated damages for $388 billion, which is the GDP of Denmark. Or to say it differently, it's the GDP of Ukraine, Vietnam, and Romania together. Okay? So this is starting to have real serious consequences. The second reason why we're here is that cybercrime is the best investment on the planet. There is nothing that compares cybercrime in terms of return on investment. This is uh, your typical, average, mm, stupid, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, campaign against uh, home banking users. Uh, this is uh, something that w happened to ABN Ambro in this case. And from what you can see here, the return on investment for these criminals, which are not hackers, these are users of hacking tools. They are not hackers, these are criminals. Their return on investment was 750% in a week. There is nothing like this. If you sell weapons, drugs, human beings, organs, whatever, you cannot make this much with uh, such a small risk. Okay, so this is a problem because everything starts from cybercrime. All the techniques that they develop will then spread and reach on the lower end, the script kiddies, and on the other side, uh, those who do cyber espionage and information warfare. It's the same techniques used by, with different purposes. So if they make a lot of money and if they have a lot of resources, it's bad because they develop all the tools that then can be weaponized and become cyber weapons, and so on. The third reason why we're here is that there is a huge growing market for zero days, especially in the SCADA DCS field, which is becoming mainstream. In a, f a few years ago, it was a very stealth, underground, black thing, and nobody was really willing to talk about it. Now. I received this. This is from two days ago. Good day. We are a team and we have found zero-day vulnerability which are exploitable in some top and famous application. If you are interested in buying, kindly of reply back. On LinkedIn. Come on. <laughs> this is crazy. They send us Excel files full of zero days with POCs and everything available from India, from Pakistan, from China, from the Philippines, every day. So this is a huge issue because a zero day, of course, this is depressing the market. So a zero day that was, for example, 300,000 euros last year, this year you can buy it for 50,000 euros of the same seriousness. Okay, It's not the same zero day, of course, it's, it's a new one, but it's depressing the market, which means that it's becoming mainstream. This is a very, very big issue. As we said, cybercrime is extremely profitable, but remember that there are also activists, spies, mercenaries, cyber warriors, even if I don't like to call them this way. Uh, these, are data, these, uh, uh, these graphs are from the Clusit report. As you can see, in the first half of 2013, we see more or less cybercrime staying the same in our sample, of course. Hacktivism growing, but this is not anonymous anymore. This is not Western 
youngsters which play uh, like they are um, Peter Pan, okay? These are from uh, the Syrian Electronic Army, from Pakistan, from India, from Muslim countries and so on. Of course, it means that their way of thinking, the, the way of looking at the consequences of what they do is totally different. For the Syrian Electronic Army or another crew like a Palestinian hacker, Mauritania hacker and so on, to shut down the Milan Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange is not really an issue. While for a Western guy from Anonymous in 2011 or 12, it, it was different. So this is introducing very, very strange uh, possible outcomes. Uh, since critical infrastructures are a very valuable target, we just saw what the uh, previous speaker said, uh, they are under attack from many different actors, from different reasons, for blackmailing a, a criminal that says, I will open up the dam and flood the valley if you don't pay me this amount of money in, on a Cayman uh, Island bank account. For uh, espionage, of course, sabotage, information warfare, and so on. But still, remember that everything starts from here. Those who now are being used for black ops, even by military, are from cyber criminal origins or cyber criminals, mercenaries. There are very, very few countries who already have their own enrolled uh, cyber warriors which are part of the army. Many, many countries and organizations are outsourcing black ops to cyber criminals. In a nutshell, this, uh, everyone is now a target. All platforms are now a target. We, we have PCs and servers, Windows stuff, of course, but also we have all mobile platforms, platforms, social media, cloud platforms, SCADA, everything now is a target. It wasn't like this until, let's say, on a large scale, two or three years ago. This is a problem because we need to defend much more stuff than before. Uh, traditional defenses are not working anymore. We will talk a little bit about firewalls a little bit later, or antiviruses and so on. All this stuff is almost transparent to the latest threats. It's like it wasn't there, more or less. Hmm? Uh, and of course, when we talk about critical infrastructures, we must keep in mind that growing risk of systemic black swans. A black swan is, uh, is an HILP, so it's a high impact, low probability event. The problem is that the probability is growing. <laughs> and also, well, law enforcement agencies don't have the right tools to fight all these things because of cross transnational issues, different jurisdictions, uh, old laws, and so on. So how do we handle all these issues and mitigate these threats? And how do we reshape our critical infrastructures to prevent these attacks? Let's see some data first. This is the victim's distribution from our sample as you can see, this year, in, in the first half of 2013, we had to add a category which we didn't use before in the previous two years. Because open, noisy attacks to critical infrastructures were non-existent before and now exist. Which means that the attackers don't even care to behave in a stealthy way anymore. Okay? <coughs> But stealth, slow, and nastiest attacks are spreading faster. Um, of course, the information warfare side of this problem is probably, potentially at least, the most worrisome. Uh, because in the last five years, information and cyber warfare have become a reality. Nations are spending billions on these issues. 
there are now cyber commands with hundreds or thousands of uh, military and civilian uh, people working in them. The problem is that many actors are developing these capabilities, and many of them are not nation states. I used to say I will be in Macedonia at the NATO Summer School for Cyber Defense next week, and I will have a presentation where I go in much, much more deeper detail on this issue. Uh, cyberspace has eliminated the monopoly of power for nation states which is something that, after a Westphalian peace in the 18th century, was given for granted. The state had the monopoly of power. This is not true anymore. This is strange, strange times that we are living. Because there are Mexican or Colombian drug cartels that now have more cyber firepower in cyberspace than Italy. And this completely changes the geopolitical equilibrium of the world. Hmm? It doesn't matter if you have <coughs> uh, carriers or submarines or, you know, if you can be shut down by a small, dedicated group of elite hackers. Uh, so now we are here. Uh, we are in a situation where terrorists, mercenaries, criminals, and nation states can create lose, uh, loss of confidence in critical infrastructure, which is even worse than just shutting it down. If you cannot trust your waste disposal system, for example, in Italy we have a law that says that if you cannot prove that the emissions in the atmosphere of certain substances are uh, below the threshold, you have to shut down the waste burner, okay? If you just, uh, if you're able just to change the data in the pollution monitoring system, you have, you will provoke the whole waste burning system to be shut down which then takes probably three or four days to be uh, um, turned on back again. So millions of people will, will remain without waste, uh, uh, in this case, without their waste partner, just by changing a database. Mm? Uh, so the, lose of the, the loss of confidence is probably one of the worst things. Of course, then there are uh, malware-based attacks which can disrupt, disrupt or destroy plants, which are also very, very dangerous. Uh, this is something that I shouldn't show you, <laughs> but it really has me to tell you what's going on. This map is the sur uh, attack surface map of a certain nation. All you see here, this was of course, there is a lot of intelligence behind it, but what you see here is who to attack if you want to shut down that nation. And of course, if you click on those boxes, you see all the names, the addresses, the you know, IPs, everything that's needed to hit. And for every country on Earth, now there is a surface attack map uh, sorry, attack surface map like this, somewhere. Certainly someone has the same map for Switzerland, for Italy, for the United States, for Germany, for, you know. So what we see here is that in the core systems that must be taken down in order to attack a nation, half of them are critical infrastructures, energy, Transport, media, <laughs> of course, some ICT companies, telcos, and so on. Government organs, which are not critical infrastructures, uh, but they are, in fact. <laughs> okay, if you uh, make the government in a position that they cannot work, well, th the nation will, of course, suffer. So, <coughs> we're talking about something that can have amazing, amazing consequences. 
and and everybody is just in the preparation stage to do something like this. Some we see some tests here and there. So it's probably something that will be deployed in the next years. We will see it. It, it sounds like science fiction, but we are going to see it probably in one year, two years, I don't know, three years. When there is a capability, <laughs> usually humans tend to use it. <coughs> the problem with cyber warfare is that it's a very broad spectrum of digital attack techniques. Within the reach of a growing number of actors, which are used for different purposes with variable intensity and against any kind of target, among them critical infrastructure. So now we are in this situation. We have nation states, intelligence community, law enforcement, organized cybercrime, activists, industrial spies, terrorists, corporations, mercenaries, all in a kind of Wild West <laughs> uh, situation, fighting one against the other and all together. <laughs> So it's a problem. We see requests on the black market for offensive tools, and we follow the tracks to see who is really asking for, for these tools, and you end up with a corporation that makes yappers, okay, or toothpaste. And they are actively trying to buy offensive tools on the black market. Why? <laughs> it's strange. The world is changing, really. <coughs> This is very interesting. It's a small part of a very huge graph by the World Economic Forum that says that the biggest technological threats that would lead, would lead to critical system failure are cyber attack, data fraud or theft, and massive digital misinformation. And for example, the Associated Press incident was mentioned by the previous speaker. Uh, created for five minutes a huge, huge loss on the New York Stock Exchange, which lost more than 5% of its value in five minutes. But this was a test. The Syrian Electronic Army only hacked one Twitter account, Associated Press. What would have happened if they hacked 15 different new, uh, news agency accounts at the same time and spread the same tweet from 15 different, like uh, CNN, BBC, and so on, at the same time. Instead of lasting five minutes, the crisis would have lasted probably one hour or two hours, and probably the world economy would have crashed, seriously. So this capability is in the hands of nearly everyone, because hacking a Twitter account is a trivial attack by using very standard, low-level phishing techniques, uh, or things like that. It's just a matter of having the idea and planning it and executing it. But even I could do it. <laughs> so um, massive digital misinformation can be used in a mix with malware and other ve attack vectors to multiply the effect of an attack on critical infrastructures. We have simulated recently an attack on the Italian banking anti-fraud system by using NFC. You know what NFC is? This funny, crazy new technology which has no security whatsoever. Uh, so when you have, like we have in Italy, 26 million smartphones and half of them already have NFC built in, if you can create a big enough smartphone botnet, and then you trigger a clearly false NFC transaction from each infected smartphone, you flood the anti-fraud system, and it stops working. Because it was designed to handle 2,000, 3,000 frauds per hour, and if you hit it with 200,000 false frauds in an hour, it shuts down. And then you can do any kind of uh, real attack, of course, while it is shut down, because the banks will not stop the uh, banking, of course. Mm? So, <coughs> also we have a, 
an issue, by the way, which lies in the definition of critical infrastructure. If you see what the European Union said, critical infrastructure is a very, very strict definition. In my opinion, this is uh, understandable f under political reasons because nobody wants to be declared critical infrastructure because this is going to cost them a lot of money. So if you are declared critical infrastructure is a problem. But uh, uh, of course, critical infrastructures are, <coughs> are also, for example, the ATM systems or logistical systems that bring food to supermarkets even if they are not mentioned and comprised within the formal definition of critical infrastructure. Um, latest attacks. Since a lot of researchers are doing their, their best to find them, since 2012 and 10, SCADA vulnerabilities, known SCADA vulnerabilities, have increased by 25 times. It's probably the field where we had the biggest growth of known vulnerabilities. 50% of these allow to execute code. So they are, uh, it's possible to weaponize them. They actually work in, a, in the real world. They're not just funny uh, theories. And there are already exploits for 35% of the vulnerabilities. 41 are critical. 41%, and more than 40% of the systems which have SCADA critical systems behind them exposed on the internet can be exploited with Metasploit, not with elite, strange uh, techniques. Uh, and I don't know if you are working in a critical infrastructure or have just a curiosity if you ever search yourself on Shodan and see the Shodan search engine is a nice search engine that lists all the vulnerable SCADA systems on the planet. You just go in there and search yourself like on Google and you will see a list of exposed servers, routers, and so on, which are known to be vulnerable. If you want more, of course, I suggest you to read this report from the, uh, it's from last year, 2012, very interesting. Uh, <coughs> and this leads us to the attack techniques distribution, again from the Clusit uh, small sample. What we see is that Still, in 2013, the majority of attacks were made of serious, serious, big, huge cyber attacks in the world, successful serious cyber attacks, were made with well-known techniques, exploiting bugs and or the lack of patching, misconfigurations, organizational flaws, lack of, aware of awareness, and so on. All vulnerabilities that could and should be patched or fixed easily and they make up nearly 70% of the, of the attack vectors used by the worst cyber attacks in the first six months of this year, which is uh, certainly telling us that the defenders really have to work better. Mm? In this scenario, we also saw that Thus, the number of service attacks increased by 44% in number, in frequency, in volume, I mean in bandwidth, they increased much more than 44% in the last six months. Uh, probably you heard about this fight in between Spamhouse and a small company of spammers, where they generated through DNS, open relay amplification, 300 gigabit per second of denial of service attack. Consider that the uh, Internet Exchange hub in Milan, which is the hub that connects Italy to Internet, has a peak bandwidth consumption of 115 gigabit per second. So the spam house attack was twice as much bandwidth as Italy's 
bandwidth toward the rest of the world at peak time. So, DOS attacks increased in number, but most importantly, they increased in bandwidth and impact. And APTs, advanced persistent threats, increased in our small sample by 900%, which basically means that attacks made with a simple malware or with just one attack vector are not used anymore or less and less used nowadays. Attacks are becoming complex, so they will use social media attack plus phishing, spear phishing plus malware plus something else, you know? So this makes defending our systems much more complicated. How could an attack to a SCADA DCS within a critical infrastructure plant or organization work? Uh, well, this is the typical flow. They attack the business part of the network with the us uh, usual techniques. And when they have control of this business workstation, they make uh, some survey. They see there is a firewall going uh, in, the, in a skater direction. They follow the, the, the packets. They find the, the SCADA systems. And the SCADA systems have no protections. In many cases, you cannot even install protections on SCADA systems. If you just add an antivirus on a, your typical SCADA system server is a Windows 2000 without service pack <laughs> installed on it because it's from 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And you cannot update it because it, it breaks down. And anyway, since it has to work, you cannot even reboot it and so on. So as soon as you cross this barrier, it's, it's, it's over. It's definitely over. You can reach from the engineering workstations, the RTU, and then the PLCs. And then you can open the dams uh, doors and flood the valley, OK? Or shut down the grid and so on. <coughs> or simply, as I saw in a, in a case I followed in 2011 in Italy, they shut down the bigger refrigerators of the Italy's biggest uh, supermarket chain. All of them. <laughs> OK. So they just shut down all the refrigerators. And by the law, after half an hour, all the food must be, had to be thrown away because of the law. <coughs> so this is how it happens every day. Even while we are speaking, even now, it is happening all the time. Uh, but of course, you can also hack Latvia's <laughs> thermal power generator, only thermal power generator, from the internet. This was a very interesting case. These guys from a university in China hacked the whole control system of Latvia's only thermal power generator. They had passwords for everything. They even posted uh, screenshots with their mouse arrow on the controls of the, of the power plant. Okay? And this was made attacking it from the internet. Hmm? Well, here there are a few examples. I don't want to spend too much time here. You will, uh, if you want to study all these cases, you will have the presentation. But for example, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, the American DHS last year, declared that they had 51 critical infrastructure organization breached in many different ways and of course with different outcomes. Uh, and then this year, a malicious virus shattered U.S. power plant. Or a malware attacked oil rigs and, and uh, made them 
impossible to, to operate. Or cyber attack leaves natural gas pipelines vulnerable to sabotage. In this case, it was 23 natural gas pipeline operators, which means that if you, for some reason, create a disruption on all 23, you probably stop the gas, dis gas distribution in half of the United States. If you do it in winter, it's going to be a, a real mess. Okay. Uh, apparently, this was China's military hackers trying to get uh, access to these systems in order to be able to use them in case of necessity. But this is happening everywhere. I've seen in Italy power plants or other uh, plants of this kind, water plants and so on, already compromised with backdoors and stuff ready to be used. These are some more attacks. I just cut from my Excel, so please uh, forgive the, the, the messy look of this, uh, of this uh, slide. You see, here are the dates. These are collected globally, so you see things from Turkey to US to Italy to whatever. There are even more, and you can, of course, go through them if you want uh, later. Okay, remediations, question mark. The first thing, we already said the first thing, that the, pers the risk perception nowadays, the average risk perception is completely wrong. People don't know that they could wake up in the morning and don't have water or electricity or gas, and that it can happen anytime. Uh, this uh, graph, it's very interesting because this is in the Department of Homeland Security paper saying how to perform risk assessment on your critical infrastructure, ICT, critical infrastructure as a whole uh, plant. It's still the same since 2003, but this is so wrong. In 2003, they said, okay, cyber attack can impact computer workstations, servers, and routers, but not electric power, heating, ventilation, uh, air conditioning, uh, security systems, cameras, telephone systems, and so on. This was true in 2003. They still teach this, but it's wrong. Nowadays, you can also impact cameras, uh, physical security systems, uh, telephone systems, heating, ventilation, electric power, and so on, through cyber attacks. So, update your risk perception. Second, <coughs> assume compromise. Assume compromise means that you are most probably already hacked. Not that you will probably, maybe, if you are lucky, be hacked in the future. I'm, I don't see a clean network since probably five years. Everywhere I go, there is something already inside the network. Okay. 94% of these 7,200 known web-based interfaces connected to critical infrastructures in the US were attacked in 2012. These are the official data. And several of them were breached. But the attack vectors are so many that, in fact, the probability, the probability that you are not in a, some way breached are extremely low. So assume compromise. This completely changes your point of view. If you think in terms of you, uh, that you are already hacked, it's not anymore defending the castle from the barbarians outside the walls because they are already inside the castle. So you have to change your strategy completely. You cannot fight making higher walls nowadays because they're useless. <coughs> Second or third, defense in depth must become your new mantra. Firewalls are cool, but I found this today. So let me just switch from, from PowerPoint to this. DISA, which is the 
United States Defense Department is building a single security architecture that will eliminate fire firewalls in the future. The future architecture will be designed to protect data rather than networks, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so. Uh, firewalls are not the solution, especially in complex environments like critical infrastructures and SCADA environments. So what is defense in depth? It's taking care of all these, all these layers at the same time in a holistic way. So perimeter controls, access controls, cyber controls, until you reach the application security control. As you can see here, since we are today at the application security forum, <coughs> The last layer before the core operational services is application security. This gives you an idea of how much important it is. Um, and then monitor everything. Evaluate risks in real time. I see places where they make uh, uh, risk assessments once a year. <laughs> this is doesn't work because in a year, everything is going to change dramatically. Manage your vulnerabilities all the time. Adopt a secure development life cycle. Develop and test your business continuity and disaster recovery processes, which usually, when it in you need them, don't work <laughs> if you haven't tested them very well. Conclusions. Um, OK. Probably <laughs> I was able to transfer you the concept that we have an issue, okay, with, with critical infrastructures. It's not my PC or, you know, some business that is shut down for one day or two days because of a Trojan or a, Trojan or a virus. This is much more serious. Uh, the, problem, the real problem is that since many organizations don't have the real-time monitoring and post-incident cyber analysis tools, they cannot distinguish between a normal system failure and a real attack, like it happened in Iran with Stuxnet. They didn't know for months that they were being attacked. They thought their centrifuge were faulty. Okay? <laughs> so, eliminate uncertainty at all levels. You must have a very, very, very good uh, situational awareness of the situation, and last but not least, specific skills must be developed. So train and train other people, and uh, we need many more experts in this field. There aren't enough nowadays. So questions for 30 seconds probably, because I use all my time, right? Yes, we have one minute for question. Je sais pas s'il y a des questions. Is there any question? Any question? Okay. Um, we see that uh, many SCADA systems are vulnerable because they've been developed many years ago and they have very simple flaws that are easy to exploit. Is there any chance that we could motivate the builders of those systems to change that? Yes. Do we, do we have any levers? Wonderful, level? wonderful question. It depends on your procurement. It's not security, <laughs> it's procurement. If in a bid they put some very strict requests in terms of cyber security, vendors will comply. Same thing happened with cars. My 1961 Fiat, 71 Fiat, wasn't built by an automotive industry pressed by a security requests from the public. So it had no security in it. So procurement will make SCADA systems secure. Contracts, insurances, OK? It's a very, very good question. Uh, well, but anyway, I want to leave you with a hope, with some hope. My motto is stay frost and carry on. <laughs> These are my contacts if you want to discuss uh, any issue that we've been talking today, of course I'm available. Thank you. Okay, thank you Andrea for your talk.